Hi there. Good afternoon. I'm Courtney Bailey, the Grant and Scholarship Manager at the Colorado Restaurant Foundation and currently the point person here for all things ProStart. I'm joined today by Laura Schunk, the Foundation President, and our guest speaker, Brittany Mestis, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But first, I want to thank you for joining us for our virtual masterclass. This masterclass is the third in a series we'll be holding over the next two months. We all know that COVID-19 has made this an incredibly challenging year. Many of you have probably spent much of your year learning remotely and unable to access much hands-on learning as you normally have. We applaud you for your resilience through this crisis. Master classes are meant to connect you with hospitality industry professionals so that you can explore different career paths and learn relevant skills from top experts. In normal years, we would try and facilitate these connections in person. But since we can't do that this year, we've created the Colorado Pro Start Virtual Masterclass Series so that you can peek into different culinary and hospitality worlds and meet some of the stars in the in industry. With that, please allow me to introduce Brittany Mestis. Brittany's passion for hospitality and lodging began at age 16 when she started working at her first major hotel, JW Marriott in Cherry Creek. She graduated from Johnson & Wales University with a degree in sports entertainment and event management. Brittany continues to build her career and gained experience by working her way through the ranks at Sage Hospitality and Marriott Hotels, holding various positions over the last 17 years. She is now the Director of Sales and Marketing at Spring Hill Suites, Denver downtown. She's also a teacher at Metro State University School of Hospitality, a part-time wedding planner, and a business owner of BK Event Design. Brittany will talk about everything she's learned in the hotel industry, from catering to sales, marketing, and customer service. If you have any questions or comments for Brittany, please use the Q&A function in your Zoom window. We will be recording this masterclass and we will send the link to teachers within 24 hours so that students can view it on demand. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brittany. Thank you so much, Courtney. And it's a pleasure to speak to you guys today. And I can't wait to share all of my learnings from uh, my industry experience with you. So today we're going to talk a little bit about selling food and beverage. I think some of the master classes you might have already viewed are a lot about the actual cooking, but this is going to talk a little bit more about how, what it takes to get to that point. So how we sell food and beverage in the hospitality industry. So a little bit about myself. I know Courtney gave me an introduction. Um, I moved out here from San Francisco, went to college here, got my degree in sports entertainment event management. I worked the entire time I was in college, and that will be my first tip um, to give each of you is as you're in college, if you can work and make your education and your experience match each other, you become a really powerful candidate as you go to graduate and take your next steps in your career. While I was um, pursuing my career, I actually finished my master's in business, and um, I worked at several different hotels. So I've been a catering manager at the Courtyard in Cherry Creek. I worked for some time at a Hilton Garden Inn down south. Um, most recently, I worked at part of our area sales team with all of these hotels you can see on the screen. We had four hotels in downtown Denver. I've spent time at the Denver Airport Marriott, and then right now I'm currently the Director of Sales and Marketing for the Spring Hill Suites in downtown Denver at Metro State University, and I've also been teaching courses at Metro State. So hopefully one day I'll get to see all of you in one of my classes. So let's talk a little bit about the, the selling role. So first step is qualifying our business or our inquiries. So if somebody calls and you, they, you're ready to take their event on, there are questions that you need to ask, right? So you receive that call, you're so excited to book this awesome event, and then how does our selling process begin? So first, you want to qualify the inquiry. So there are certain things that you need to ask for, kind of what I consider to be like the basics of a sales call. So you need to understand what's the organization name? Is this a corporation? Is this a not-for-profit? Who's What kind of an organization is contacting you? Then you want to find out what kind of a, a meeting name or a group name. Maybe you work with the same company over and over again, and you need to have a different name for that meeting so that you can differentiate their programs. Next, you need to understand who's the person calling you and what's their title. The title is actually important for the person that you're contacting it, because you need to understand if that person is a decision maker or if that person is simply somebody just gathering information. Then you need to also break down and get some of the basics. What's their mailing address? Do they have a phone number you can call them back at? How about an email address? 
And then you need to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what the program is about, what they're actually inquiring about. So you're going to ask about what are the dates that they're looking to host an event or a meeting? Is there a certain time of day that they had an expectation for that event? And what about the seating style? And the seating style is important because when you're adding tables and chairs into a meeting room or an event venue, that's different than if you're doing a standing room only where you just are, are networking with other individuals. And especially now more than ever with COVID-19 happening, we really need to keep our setups very spacious and keep everything really spread out to make everybody feel safe. So understanding the seating style is very critical. And then you want to ask more about the meeting purpose, and we'll jump more into this in our next few slides. You want to understand the billing. If you're going to provide a service, at the most basic, you need to make sure you're going to be paid for that service at the end. And then you want to also ask, what's the frequency of this meeting? Does this meeting happen four times a year, once a year? Is this a one, one event and it's never, ha never going to happen again? So understanding the meeting frequency is important because maybe you can offer them a bigger discount if they're willing to sign for four meetings with you rather than just one meeting. All right, asking the right questions. This part is so critical. So what I was talking about earlier with the meeting purpose is um, this is from Marriott Hotels. They actually came up with these several sections that talk about what kind of an event somebody might be having, having and this would be the purpose. So one being celebrate, decide, educate, ideate, network, produce, and promote. And essentially, all, all calls coming to you or if you're calling someone to have them book with you, all can be put into this category. I've also left a, a link to Pinterest on here, and this is because Marriott Hotels created a, a website called Meetings Imagined. And essentially, this is literally a tool that meeting planners can use similar to Pinterest, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but it's just for meetings. So people have posted very amazing pictures of um, the most basic meeting to the most elaborate wedding you could ever imagine, and it's a great place to get inspiration for what you're going to do and how you're going to create an event for someone. You also want to ask, is there a budget to be mindful of? I feel like there's a, this is a really kind way to ask, um, what are the boundaries for this meeting? Obviously, we would love budgets that have no limits, but those, are, those events are hard to come by, and traditionally, somebody does have a budget requirement they're having to stick within. You want to ask, are their dates flexible? And this is important because perhaps you've got a set of dates at your hotel or at your event venue that are really desirable. So I like to think about weddings being desirable over our warm summer months here in Colorado. Well, that might be more costly than somebody who's willing to get married in the wintertime. So if, the, if you can be flexible with the, the date or the time of season, you would be able to offer them perhaps a bigger discount. And then I always like to ask all of my meeting planners, um, what's the most important in selecting a, a property, either a hotel or a venue or a restaurant? And a lot of times it actually does not come down to budget. Maybe safety of location, quality of food. There are several different types of um, reasons somebody may give you for making a decision at, for your property. But it's really important to ask this question because if you know what the main need of the planner is, you can meet that and then perhaps win the business and go ahead and continue booking with them. So let's dive further into some of the purposes of the meeting. So we talked about Celebrate. Celebrate is essentially just a, you're going to commemorate a milestone, a wedding, a birthday, uh, maybe it's an anniversary party. And those can be so much fun. They offer so much creativity. Or decide can be another type of meeting. So the objective might be to just have a dialogue and make a decision. Maybe you're trying to decide which product you're going to launch at a corporation. So you're going to get a group of key decision makers together to make a decision. Educate. This one, um, we do tons of meetings with this um, sort of topic in mind. So this would be a training, right? Or as you're sitting in class today, you're in an educational setting. So we have tons of meetings, and we refer to most of these as our training meetings. But those are the key purpose would be to educate. Next is ideate. So perhaps you're trying to get a group of people together to maybe solve a problem. Um, maybe you just need people to think differently. And so you're going to get everyone together to come up with a solution. Maybe the uh, object of your program is to network, and this might be that you need to get people together. Maybe you've got teams on, uh, in New York, and then you've got teams in San Francisco, and you need to bring them together so that they can meet each other. So uh, Everyone's probably so familiar now with all of our virtual learning that we often don't get to meet together in person. This, Although now it's a challenge, this eventually will come back together again, and networking is so important. 
maybe the purpose of the meeting is to produce. Maybe you need to get people together and they're going to actually produce some amount of work. Maybe that's writing a business proposal. Maybe it's doing actual hands-on work that needs to be completed. And then lastly, promote. So promotions might be you're going to promote a new sales topic or a new product launch, and you're going to get all of your sales team excited to help start promoting this product. So again, all meetings that are going to call you or you're inquiring with them can all fall in one of these categories, and it just helps you become a better planner for the, the meeting program itself. So I wanted to give some examples as we're talking about all of these topics. What, is, what do the events look like, right? So you'll see you've got Celebrate. You've got that beautiful kind of purple, blue lighting, beautiful orchids, candlelight. To me, this looks like it's some a formal dinner. Maybe it's a wedding. And then I have a picture of Educate. So you can see there's chairs that are at tables. Everyone's facing screens in the front of a, a classroom. And here you can tell that they're clearly trying to do some form of training or education. The other image I have here is of networking. So perhaps you have a social aspect where there's a bar or food and beverage service being offered, and you have a group of people coming together to get to know each other. Maybe everybody works together at the same company, but again, they could be on opposite sides of the world. Maybe some people are in Australia while others are here in the United States. And this is a great way to get people together and get to know each other to work better together. So these are just some Im different images for you to understand kind of how these topics or the purpose of your meeting might look. So now we've talked a little bit about um, who's calling us, we're qualifying this information, we're understanding the purpose of their meeting. Now, who do we sell to? So we've got several different types of people we would sell to. And again, these are broken down into several categories. So first I want to start with our corporate meeting. So these are anybody, essentially if you're Googling a website and it has a .com, that is traditionally probably a corporation. Several different corporations. Um, I'm sure if you were to look at the attire you have on, you're wearing a brand name of some kind, and that is essentially a corporation. And all of those corporations have meetings, whether it's any of the meeting purposes we've described, but definitely have an opportunity to come together. Associations. Oh, goodness, there is an association for everything. Um, any hobby, any interest, there is an association about everything. So this is a great way if maybe, um, you know, in Colorado, we explore the great outdoors. So here we actually work with a program called Outdoor Retailer. They're an association, and they bring together everything that has to do with the outdoors to Colorado. But it's an association you belong to to learn more about. And then there's the Smurf market, and I'm not talking about the, the little blue people you might know that are cartoons. Rather, this is an acronym that stands for several different segments. So the S being sports or social, I've seen it both ways, military, educational, religious, and fraternal groups. So sports being maybe you're going to work with major sports teams. Maybe it's a college team or a high school club team that's traveling. Or social, if this could be weddings, um, anniversary parties, birthday parties, anything that kind of falls into that social category. Maybe you're going to work with a military group. Maybe there's a big awards dinner for a military program that you're going to put together. Educational groups. So much like I work part-time for Metro State University, that's an educational institution. So I could definitely put on tons of programs for them. Or religious organizations. Maybe there's a church group that's traveling and we would capture some of their business and they're hosting different dinners and award ceremonies. And then I always find the F in Smurf to be the hardest, fraternal groups. It's, it's hard to imagine, like, what is a fraternal group? The easiest way to think about this segment is maybe it's a club. So maybe it's um, the Rotary Club or the Lions Club. Perhaps there's a club on campus that would kind of qualify under this. Um, but fraternal groups, think about it as a club or an organization. Next up would be government groups. They have tons of different types of meetings that they conduct, um, from educational seminars to awards dinners, but government being all at different aspects of our government, from federal, state, to local. Um, I know we work really closely with CDOT, our Colorado Department of Transportation, because they have a building that's just down the street from us. So lots of different segments of the government that you can work with. Then we have a category for extended stay. So this is specific to folks that are staying for seven or more nights at our hotels. Maybe they have a group of people that have come to do a project for a company and they're gonna meet for dinner every so often and you can help coordinate those functions. 
Then you've got the travel and tour or entertainment segment. This one's really fun. This might be um, somebody's coming because there's a major concert happening at the ball arena, and they need their crew and the production crew to have a place to stay at the hotel. Maybe they're going to do dinner every night together. Maybe they need a, a, a green room to go ahead and, like, prepare and do some practice runs of different things. So travel and tour has its own segment, um, which falls with same with entertainment. I'm going to pause for a second. Courtney, do we have any questions up to this point? Um, yeah, we do have a question. Okay. Um, so our students are wanting to know um, what kind of attitude and skills are required for me to, to go into this industry and kind of um, climb this achievement ladder? Where do I start? Awesome. That's a great question. I feel like, um, and I'll, I'm going to end, end with this at the end of our presentation, but I do want to address this. Definitely you're going to have to have a positive attitude going into any workplace. I feel like sales in particular maybe takes a more outgoing personality, somebody who's okay to sit and talk with strangers. Um, I find that you can be really effective in hospitality if you have a lot of curiosity, if you just know how to ask a lot of questions and want to learn more. Um, but there are so many skills. Even if, let's say you're looking at this career path and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to be Brittany. Selling seems too outrageous to me, and I, I prefer a more internal role at a company. Totally jobs for you, too. We have a, an accounting department, and they just don't interact as often with our clients or the public. Um, definitely, or if you find that you are outgoing and you want to just get started, the front desk is a great spot. That's where I started my career. It kind of helps you learn about all the different departments that we have at the hotel. Uh, maybe you want to get into housekeeping and understand how to maintenance, you know, 150 rooms. So lots of different departments um, and places that you can kind of fit in depending on, like, your personality style and what you feel comfortable with. Any other questions I can address, Courtney? Nope, you're doing good. Keep okay. going. Okay. Okay, so how do we connect and reach our clients? So a number of ways. I had to put social media first because I feel like we can all understand social media, right? Everybody's got Facebook and Instagram. Maybe you've got a TikTok following, but definitely a means for you to get in touch with your clients is through social media. Maybe there's television commercials. Maybe you're doing different mailers. I know it seems so old to think about snail mail, but there's different demographics that need different needs in order to connect with our clients. How about email? I mean, that's probably the most popular way that I connect with my clients because I can email so many people at one time and get information across to them. Maybe you're going to, there's an advertisement you're going to post in a magazine or on a billboard and your clients are going to find your phone number that way. Maybe you simply are just going to pick up the phone and you're going to call someone or they've called you to inquire. Perhaps you've stopped into an office and you you went to visit another client, and while you were there, you realized there was another need for more another a client that had a meeting happening. Maybe it's simply a walk-in. We get these from time to time, um, a lot from brides and grooms that are looking to check out the hotel for a wedding. They just walk into the hotel and have inquiries. Um, my new favorite tool is we do virtual tours, so we have an entire 360-degree um, tour of our hotel. It's really interactive. You can click and see all the spaces inside the hotel. So a lot of times um, I may be working with a client that's across, you know, the other side of the United States or the world, and it's really hard for me to be able to do an in-person tour for somebody. So the virtual tour really allows me to get in touch with our clients virtually. How about a referral? Maybe somebody works at the hotel or somebody's aunt has given you a referral for a client to book a birthday party or a baby shower. And then the, the best and easiest way is repeat business. If you've already had a client come and book with you and they feel satisfied, that's the best time to make another sale and ask if they have another meeting that you might be able to help them with. Even if it's not at your own hotel, perhaps they have the same meeting they've held in Denver, again in Dallas or New York City, and you can refer it to another hotel partner by assisting them with that connection. So ask what the client's preferred method of communication is. This is so important. Some people prefer that we talk over the phone every time, while others feel more um, inclined to do email because they're too busy to take a call. The other thing I have to consider when connecting with clients about with our communication style is what time of day is it? If I'm calling somebody in Hong Kong and it's the middle of my day, well, it may be the middle of their night, so they wouldn't be answering their phone at 3 o'clock in the morning. So an email might be a little bit more appropriate in order for us to communicate. 
You also want to be sure that you're explaining why you're contacting that person. So when you get on the phone and you're starting to make this call to connect with a client, it's important to make sure that they understand, oh, I understand why Brittany's calling. She's with a hotel and she's asking if we have meetings. If I just say my name is Brittany and I'm at the hotel, they may be confused on why you're calling. And then always important to get to know your clients. So relationships make it so much easier for you to upsell and just do sales in general or planning somebody's event. If you get to know somebody, imagine you understand their needs a lot better. I feel like if you don't know somebody at the beginning of a conversation, it's really important to pick a very neutral topic. We're never going to talk about politics and religion with our clients because it would be inappropriate. But a neutral topic, like the weather, can sometimes actually be somewhat exciting. Perhaps we're having a blizzard here in Colorado while somebody in Florida is just understand having 95-degree weather. So sometimes it's fun and you can share a laugh over weather, and it's a very neutral topic to discuss. All right, upselling, my favorite topic. Anytime I can earn more revenue for the hotel and also assist the client in creating a spectacular event, I'm all about it. So I have this image here because I think it's so much fun to take really um, ordinary objects and make them somewhat unordinary. In this case, you can see that there's lunch service being served out of a canoe. What a unique way to make a really fun event extra creative. Maybe in this instance, it was um, it's like a backyard party or a, a wedding that somebody did. But what if you were working with a company who built canoes? What a fun way to do food service and to also tie in the theme of their business. So here's more images I want to share just about some different creative touches. So no more are the days where we are just doing boring catering service. Sure, if a client asks for those, we can meet that need, but I always like to take a next step up. If a client's budget allows us to make something extraordinary, we'll do that. So first I want to point out we've got this beautiful gal with a hat on and a feather, and she's wearing a what we call a champagne dress. So maybe your, your plan is to have a bar service at your meeting or event. Well, why just serve champagne over a traditional bar? Instead, you can have her walk around. It's something exciting, almost like an element of entertainment, and still serve your guests um, beverages. Perhaps you are leaning towards more of a non-alcoholic event. You could serve juice out of her dress or whatever type of beverage you're looking for. But a champagne girl really brings um, an exciting element to an event just to say that you've seen this and you were served champagne this way. The other picture I want to point your attention to is how about this horse trailer that's been converted into a bar? Maybe you work at an event venue that's outdoors and doesn't have the right capabilities to have a bar on site easily. Well, what a fun way to, com to make that experience more memorable. You've got this horse trailer, they've converted into a bar, and it, you can really then park this anywhere. And it just adds one more fun piece to an event. And then we've got this picture of this beautiful bar made of completely of ice. So they've got, um, there's an ice luge. Uh, you could surely, instead of champagne or wine, you could do a juice bar. But again, a fun way, instead of just um, serving beverages from a traditional bar, this is a, an outdoor bar that is made of solid ice. And maybe your event has something to do with winter and you're trying to incorporate that into your theme. And again, this would be such a great talking point as you were planning an event. And the event planners will hear about this for years. Then if you had to go, and maybe you're not doing as elaborate of an event, but maybe you're going to serve vegetables. You can see in the photo on the bottom left that they've done a vegetable display. And rather than just putting vegetables on a tray and serving them with dip, they've placed them in a, a piece of grass. And they've got individual cups and everything's labeled. And it feels like you're literally eating vegetables out of a garden. What a unique and fun way to present a vegetable display that might otherwise be boring and no one might touch it. The next photo I want to point your attention to is the breakfast picture. We've got little individual syrups and mini pancakes. This is great when you're going to pass, uh, maybe this is a past breakfast where you're going to just have a bite size of something you're going to eat. The other thing that's great about this is everything's individual. So right now, more than ever, this is very important for our clients. With COVID-19 happening, we don't want everybody touching a lot of surfaces. So if we have individual items for each of our guests, they will feel safer perhaps enjoying those. And what a fun way to make the presentation beautiful rather than just boring. So we've talked all about these beautiful pictures. So how does that relate to selling? Well, we're not just selling a plate of vegetables. We're selling an experience, and that's what we do in hospitality. We're creating a beautiful experience. And the way that we do this is through um, images. I would say this is the easiest way I can communicate with my clients. So as you look at the photo off to the right, you can see that there's 
somewhat of, of a boring, it looks like maybe a cafeteria or a gymnasium that they just have tables and chairs, fluorescent lighting, a pretty basic room. Well, if you look at the photo below, it's the same space just transformed. In this case, it looks like it's a fancy dinner, maybe it's a wedding or an awards dinner. But isn't it amazing how through images we can really share that? It would be really hard, I think, for someone to, to look at the first image and think, oh, I'm going to get married here. But if they see that second image and how beautiful the space can be, it's really easy to help you, uh, make your client understand why they should spend money on certain items. So again, this would um, this goes right in tune with the picture, right? Adding lighting or unique food displays, it makes that event more memorable. So if it's a wedding, this is a one-time event in your life, right? You want it to be extra special. Why not spend a little extra in order to enhance the feeling of the overall event? And then use statements that explain how guests are going to feel. So feelings are so powerful. Rather than just, you're going to go and attend a meeting, what if you were explaining to your client, we want your guests to leave and feel educated and, and refreshed after they've left your training. It just sounds better than they're going to go and sit in a classroom and be trained. So sometimes when we use the, the words around feeling, it's easier for us to make a sale to a client and help them to understand why they should spend their budget on certain items. And then, of course, paint the picture. Be sure your client understands um, the, the needs, right? They need to understand what those needs are, and if you understand the needs, then you can sell to those needs as you're having a discussion. And maybe you understand even some of the wants or the desires they have, and you might be able to manipulate their budget to make some of those come alive as well. So as you're planning, I want you all to think about your five senses when you're selling or creating an event. So what, first would be your smell. So if you look at this image and you can see that there's garden and flowers everywhere, imagine that you're walking through a garden and that's the smell that you might encounter when you walk into an event. Then you're going to think about the taste. So in this case, we obviously can't see the meal that they're enjoying, but I'm sure that based on the style of the event, this is somewhat of a high-end meal. So we want to make sure that the food reflects the beautiful decor that we have. Maybe we have little bite-sized things. Maybe we're doing a tasting menu where you have 12 different courses. And again, all the food is likely to be more high-end than you would expect um, you know, at a stereotypical chain restaurant. Next is sight. So as guests are entering this beautiful room, they're seeing candles, they're seeing crystal, things are sparkling, they see all the beautiful flower arrangements. It looks really beautiful as you're looking around the space. And then hearing. This is another important aspect for events. Is there music playing? Is it quiet? What kind of sound should we expect? Although we can't hear what's happening in this image, I'm imagining maybe there's like a string quartet or really a small band that's playing, um, welcoming guests into this beautiful venue. And then touch. Touch is so important. If you were to sit down in a chair and dine with this in this beautiful function, perhaps the napkin that you put on your lap is made of silk. What does it feel like? Is the silver heavy or is it made of plastic? Making sure that all of the different senses come together and that they make sense for your event is so important. And again, it also allows your client to understand where and why they need to spend their budget in certain areas. So now let's talk about how to maximize rates and revenue. After all, I am in sales and I do desire to make a lot of revenue for the hotel. So there's a couple things I wanna talk about. So let's make that money and let's negotiate. There's never usually a hard line. You're gonna go back and forth and have some conversation with clients. So first, as you start a conversation, it's important for you to determine what the budget is. And if they can share a budget with you, that's ideal because it helps you understand realistic expectations. If a client talks to me and asks for and tells me they have a very low budget and I know that my pricing over a certain season is high, it may not be a good fit for us to work together. So the more realistic of a budget a client can give you, the better. Then you want to determine the most important needs. Now, needs are different than wants. We need to have tables and chairs in order to conduct a training. A want might be adding extra amenities into that space. Now, it's, if you can understand the difference between needs and wants, you might be able to highlight some of the wants that to a planner might feel like a need, even though you understand that that is a, just a, a want or a desire. And then be clear about why your proposal, once you've sent them, so you've put together this beautiful bid and that you're going to send this to them, why your proposal is going to exceed the needs of the client and also allow them to explore that want list. 
Now, over to the right, you can see I've got a diagram, and it's just called comfort circles. Again, this is another Marriott selling technique. But essentially, if you are going to negotiate with a client, you're going to have your like original bid or what might be a high price point, and then you're going to come up with what's your walk away and your low price? What price will not make sense and for you to need to part ways? And then what does that middle ground look like? What, how do we negotiate to kind of agree on a price that makes sense? Some clients, uh, I will tell you my favorite clients, are those that accept your high price and you're going to execute a beautiful event. And I have had clients where we'll walk away. Some people maybe don't have the budget to purchase um, rooms from like a Ritz-Carlton. Maybe they need a lower tiered hotel. And that's why we have so many brands to help appease all the different needs for different clients. But again, come up with, as you're negotiating, you're going to come up with what your high price is, what your walk away and low price is, and where you're willing to meet in the middle in order to earn a client's business. So how do we fill need periods? Business feeling slow? Let's change it. You're responsible to make sure that you get events in the door and that you're keeping busy. So seasonality, I touched on this briefly at the beginning, but this is such an important part about how we're selling. So in the downtown Denver market specifically, summer is our busy season. And if you were to transition and think maybe you're going to go up to Aspen or Vail, maybe the winter season is actually their most desirable time. So depending on when your high demand season or when the most people are inquiring with you to come and stay or book an event, this is how you can determine your price point and whether you can be flexible or not. So weather plays a big factor in a client's decision to book, and this is for a few reasons. If your group is coming from across the world, so let's use Australia for an example, while it's spring here, it's actually fall in Australia. So depending on when a program was going to come to the states from Australia, they may consider what the weather would be like, just as you would if you were traveling across the world and deciding where you'd have a vacation. Another reason weather plays a factor is thinking about social functions. Our summer season is most desirable for brides and grooms, for example, people getting married. And that's because the weather is really beautiful in the summer here. But if you were willing to do perhaps a wedding in the winter, maybe you could save a little bit more money. So to determine with your client if budget is more important or if perhaps season is more important, and this might help allow you to be more flexible while you're negotiating. And I'm gonna pause for a second. Courtney, do we have any other questions? Yeah, we do. So you're kind of talking about um, seasonality and touching a little bit on um, some trends sort of that are going to be coming up. And so a student had a question. Um, do you think after the pandemic has has gone away that we're going to see a huge increase um, in lodging and hotel revenue? And do you think that since millennials um, love to travel, that that's going to make a big, big impact? Yeah, absolutely. So definitely there's been, there's ups and downs in any industry. Obviously this pandemic in my lifetime has been the worst that I've seen hospitality, but we're already on the up and up again. My hotel specifically, obviously everyone suffered, but we're already seeing that transition. I think definitely come the summer season, again, we're going to see that big robust push and people are going to want to get out and travel. Definitely, I feel like millennials in particular have that desire to learn about experiences and see the world. And that, that doesn't just go away because there's been a pandemic. Sure, people will think about that, but I think there's still that natural curiosity and desire from people, and that will uh, give us that push and boom in hospitality. So it will definitely return. And do you think that it's going to be a lot of partnering with local businesses? So like for the students to have an example, you know, partnering with a restaurant or partnering with an event like Denver Food and Wine um, and offering kind of like a package with your hotel. They're asking if that that's a good way to um, kind of expand the hotel reach and get more business. Oh, absolutely. Great idea. All right. Whatever student thought of that, I feel like you have a future in hospitality sales for sure. We definitely create all different sorts of packages and different offerings to make things more unique. Um, everybody that is a hotel has the same basic things inside a hotel room, right? You have a bed, you have a TV, all the basic amenities. But when you create those powerful packages like that, again, you're creating those amazing experiences. And that's what differentiates why someone would book at your hotel or your venue or event venue rather than going to your competitor. So that's great. Great question. Any other questions, Courtney? I don't think so. Not right now. Okay. Awesome. 
So next I want to talk about some of the technical skills in sales. So obviously, as you can see up to this point, this is a very people-friendly position, right? I talk to all sorts of people. We plan these beautiful functions. But what are the technical skills that are related to this job? So I feel like I want to make sure everybody understands that as long as you have the right attitude about learning technical skills, those can be taught. Personality traits maybe cannot be taught. I can't make you love customer service. But can I teach you how to use a computer program? 100%. So I've listed off to the left, you can see, we our major booking system that we use in sales is called Delphi. This is where I'm managing all the profiles for my customers and understanding what meeting needs they have. And it helps me understand what my calendar of events looks like, how many group rooms that they're going to need. It's essentially my, my big platform for how I'm booking all events. I've listed Aloha on here, and that's if you want to work in the restaurant industry. This is just one platform that we use in order to take um, customer orders. If you're sitting at a table and a server serves you, our server is going to go back to a computer using Aloha software to punch in the, the order for the guest that will then give that to our chef. I've listed Fossey at the bottom. This is a Marriott-specific program. This is a program we use to check our guests in and out, but every, every hotel has some, a similar platform or something that's along the same lines, also known as a property management system. And this is where we're going to check guests in and out of our computer to know if somebody's in a guest room or not in a guest room. The next one I've listed is RFPs, which stands for um, Request for Proposal. This is essentially a document that a meeting planner is going to send to a hotel or a venue to ask you to send a proposal on if you can meet the needs of their program. So lots of different tools and computer programs. I feel like you guys are at the perfect age and demographic where you really understand all the techie stuff behind what we do in sales and can be really strong in this part of sales. So I have to mention, math can be so much fun. And I'm sure some of you are rolling your eyes saying, math fun, yuck. But it can be, right? If we think about that in terms of revenue and making money, math might be exciting, right? If you're going to get paid a salary, it might be important to understand how much money you're going to make. So the reason this is important is because if you're planning an event, you need to know how many guests ate a meal with you so that you can charge them the proper amount of money. Or how about if you did a marketing campaign, maybe you did a, a push through Facebook, you want to understand how much revenue you earned after you posted an ad on Facebook. If you spend all of your marketing budget on a program that's not working, you might need to consider moving your money and spending it somewhere else. So again, understanding where you're spending your money is so important. And then, of course, you want to make sure after you've done one of these beautiful events, did you make a profit? Did you charge the right amount of money? Should you have charged more or less? In sales, I will tell you, we never charge less. But you want to make sure that at the end, after you've paid all your bills, did you make a profit? And then for all of you as you're getting started and moving into your college roles and then into your future management roles, what kind of a salary do you want to make? Again, this math can be fun. How much money? Are you going to make $50,000, $100,000, a million dollars a year? Understanding some of the math behind how you're going to earn your salary is so important. Maybe you need to consider that you haven't thought about how you're going to pay taxes out of your paycheck. Again, another part of math that can be really fun and exciting. Okay, so why choose hospitality? So this is an industry for everyone, and I say this because a lot of times I feel like we can sometimes feel as individual there's boundaries. So, for example, I'm a female and I'm a mom, and maybe I could see this as a hurdle for me to not be able to grow my career because I don't fit into some stereotypical role. But my favorite part about hospitality is there is no square box for anything. You can be of any race, any background. You can be a mom. You don't have to be a mom. This is a role where you could really excel, and there's no just um, a square box that you need to fit in. So I want to make sure everybody understands that, because sometimes it can be really challenging as you're learning and understanding where your career will take you. I've really thrived in hospitality, and even though there are challenges that will come up, I feel like as a female wanting to be in a leadership role, in this case I'm the director of sales, this has been a really great and supportive path, and I love the different ethnicity and backgrounds that hospitality really brings together. So um, I talked about this briefly earlier, but this is a um, this job can be for extroverts and introverts. So if you're thinking, oh my gosh, selling events and putting this together seems really scary, I'd rather have a role that's a little bit more behind the scenes, 
Maybe you decide that you'll be a chef where you're going to be in a kitchen and you're not as client facing. Perhaps you're in accounting. You're going to make sure everybody pays their bills on time and generate reports for a corporate office. Depending on how, how your personality is or what you feel most comfortable with, you can certainly find a role in hotels or in hospitality. The best part is, imagine a hotel is just a little business, right? We have all the different departments that a big corporation has because we're running a business. So there is a job for all different personalities, even if you feel like selling and planning events might not be for you. So how do you get started? So you've watched this presentation, you're really excited, you feel like you're a creative person and you want to get started and start planning beautiful events. So the first step is, I would say you could enroll at a university after you graduate high school and get a four-year degree to match your experience. So Metro State University offers several different degree programs. Um, maybe you want to move out of state and find a different college that suits the needs of a culinary program. But I would say definitely get your education started. And then while you're in school, I cannot reiterate this enough, it's so critical for you to be working and going to school. Even if it's at a part-time capacity, that real-world experience is so critical to match your education. And really, getting started just depends on you. Don't sit back. Don't wait for someone to tell you to do it. It takes you taking the initiative in order to start your career. And then what can you expect? So obviously there's a lot of hard work, but there's a lot of great things too. So when I plan an event, sometimes I sit there and I think, oh my gosh, I'm going to be up all night getting everything organized and put together. But once I see the event ex executed, it's so amazing. So perhaps I've planned a wedding for a bride and groom, and we've spent the last year together planning. When that bride walks down the aisle and then walks in to see her beautiful reception that we've organized, that feeling is just, I can't, I can't quite describe it. It's really amazing. And no matter how many times I've done it, which is thousands in my career, I always have that same excitement. So you can expect, expect that you're going to work incredibly hard, but that the rewards can be really amazing. And I have to point out, I love this photo of like coconut falling on cupcakes. Surely this is the hospitality industry. So will you be um, filled with lots of amazing food and treats around you? Absolutely. And with that, I just want to thank everybody so much for this opportunity. Such a pleasure to speak to you guys, and I would love to connect with you. If you have questions or you're more intrigued about hospitality after watching this presentation, please don't hesitate to find me on LinkedIn. Send me an email. I love to share my experiences and um, my career path with uh, young individuals and would love for all of you perhaps one day to become my boss. So I challenge you to connect with me. And um, Courtney, let me know if there's any other questions I can answer. Yeah, I think we have a question. So um, our students want to know if they're ready to come and start you know, um, working, what do they need to do to stand out? when they want to pursue a job in this industry? Um, should they bring, you know, if they have certifications, a lot of these kids are SurSafe certified, have Gold Star Guest Service. So should they, what should they bring their resume, those certifications? Yeah, I would say first step is to find the position that you desire online. Fill out an application. You're definitely going to need to have a resume. Often the application process will require that you attach your resume. And any certification you have, definitely list that on the bottom of your resume. That's so, so important because those might be trainings the position requires. And if you're already certified, then maybe that bumps you ahead of another candidate because you've already completed some of that work in education. And then, of course, most importantly, if you get that interview and you're excited for the job, make sure you dress the part. I will always tell you to dress for the job you want, not for the one that you have. If you look really formal and presentable during that interview, and then I feel like it just exudes confidence, and it will really allow you to really earn that position. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Brittany. We're going to share this with all of our students and teachers and everyone. We will also send you her deck of slides so you can view that as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Everybody have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.